If you look at the picture here, what we may be talking about today, and actually you see it there, it's production in forms of capital. And production is usually something considered to be very val valuable and somebody, uh, something we are all looking for. Now, there are some basic presumptions of the entire thinking when it comes to this kind of economics and this kind of economy, namely capitalist economy. We went through them already and I'll just repeat them. It's the rational, informed, individual actor. Rationality, completely informed, and acting as individual. There is no direct communication with others to negotiate the overall topic. We talked in the one seminars about it. The rational actor is basically in prison and doesn't communicate with others. He could, she could, but in this system he, he doesn't. In certain occasions, on certain occasions, if you are in prison, you cannot. Prison is still alive. Scarcity is one of the basic concepts as well. There is something of which is not the sufficient amount available to be available for everybody to the extent he or she wants. So we are looking for something of which is not the sufficient amount available. If we have a huge pile that serves everybody, we as economists don't really see this as the major issue. What we see as major issue is if something is scarce. The other is cost-benefit principle. In which way ever it happens, but the consideration is we are always calculating what are the costs of doing something, what is the benefit of doing something, but as well, what is the cost of not doing something. So omission. If you come to seminar, if you listen instead of sitting at the back, then there is a difference to not coming or listening and trying to do your part when it comes to listening. If you go to work, you get an income. If you don't get, go to work, you don't get one. So cost-benefit analysis is always the basic concept behind our thinking in a rational way and in an informed way. We have all the information we need to do this calculation. And we do it in the rational way of this calculation. If there is another calculation behind it, we are not interested. It's about cost, economic cost, and economic benefits. And incentives matter in terms of the benefit. As higher as the benefit is, as more we think this is worthwhile to do it. And the next and last fundamental issue is comparative advantage. It is included, actually, implied in some of the others. Cost-benefit is about comparative advantage as well. We compare one and the other. What is, what is the benefit if we do it? What is the benefit if we omit it? Now, cost-benefit analysis is usually not the de about the decision between two alternatives, but it is about the decision who does what. Individuals, if you can do A better instead of I can do it, 
we divide the, uh, uh, the, the, the labor in this respect. It's between countries, and it is, of course, as well, on the individual level, I will do that work where I feel confident, where I feel I'm, I'm good at, instead of doing something where I don't know what I'm really doing about. So we can link this to what we had been talking about yesterday, and unfortunately, you again, uh, don't, can, cannot see on, on the slides properly. It's about utility production, private property, and it is about markets and the individual actors in terms of households and in terms of firms. In this context, we have to see these for five principles. So this is the, the background, the point of departure, when it comes to something we briefly touched upon as well, the accumulation and the massification and uh, scarcity, scarcity fiction, fiction, new word. Uh, so I still have to learn it myself because I created it yesterday or some days before. That actually the scarcity is sometimes given in a natural way. If you live in a desert, there is no water. That's as simple as that. But in market economies, we create artificially scarcity. We make things to be scarce in order to stimulate the demand. If there is enough, and enough for the price we are ready to pay, this is just the one price. If I reduce the supply, I can increase the price, which is good for me. Because then you are competing as people who demand what I'm offering, what I'm supplying. There is a psychological process always going hand in hand with this. And I was thinking the other day about it, or frequently about it when, when I get emails and uh, stuff. The, the strange thing of working hard. Working hard is, of course, something that has content, that has substance. But actually, we are not talking about the substance, usually, or, or frequently. We are just saying, you are working hard. You are sitting 12 hours in the office instead of eight. Nobody asks what I'm doing there. But you are hard working, you are sitting 12 hours in the office. If I'm listening to music, if I watch films, if I just sleep, this is not the point. If I go early to the office and stay late, if I work on Saturdays, as you do today, this is working hard. And this is what counts. We don't look at the outcome. We don't look at what are you actually doing, what are we doing, but we are just looking, ca calculating, counting hours. Counting output. It doesn't matter what we produce. The main thing is we produce many things, we produce much. And then as well, these Facebook, WeChat, QQ friends. Something, get as many as possible. There are other networks as well, academic networks, LinkedIn or something like this. Over 500, there, there is this limit actually, I think over, they, they, they calculate the count up to 500 and then it's over. But this is good, over 500. You are ranking high because your publication had been looked at by many people. The looked at is had been downloaded. Nobody checks if it had been read. Uh, who actually assesses the, the value of what had been downloaded? 
how often your website, your blog, had been accessed. And then we have this other thing of airline points and uh, I don't know if you co go to Carrefour, you are a club member and you collect points there as well. So it's a kind of membership thing as well. If you join the club, you are in. If you join this process of accumulation, you are in. If you've got emails, many emails, you are in. I, I calculated the other days, the number of emails I received was about 140 during one week that had been real emails, and then 450 spam mails. But this is, just push it out there. And this is how it works, actually, looking at spam mails, I'm always or, or frequently wondering, some are, are okay, meaning they make sense, and the, the first instance is you are thinking about it, is this something serious? Uh, some are obviously uh, spam. And then there are some things where I'm wondering, what is actually going on that people react on this? Why do they do this? I had been, my, my, my parents, my father deceased in Ivory Coast. Ivory Coast is very good in this. Um, and I have, I don't know how many millions and billions of, of dollar, uh, and I have to get them into your country. Can you give me actually your account number and your account details and the credit card and whatsoever that I can transfer it into your account? I, I don't understand how people can believe, and then it's dear beloved, uh, how, how can people believe and react on such an email? But, but this has happened. And apparently, it is enough. And this is how it works. They send out millions of these emails. It doesn't cost anything. So they send out millions of these emails. If they have a return, a positive return, of 0.5%, it is already a huge number. And with this, they can work. This is one part of it. And there are other parts as well uh, where it actually comes to things like uh, dealing with addresses. So in this way, they check the validity of, of email addresses, and then they bring it onto the market and sell it for advertisements. Now, what happens with all this issues, all these issues of uh, accumulation, of getting more and more and more, is what we briefly talked about already. It's concentration and centralization. If I cream off these 0.5% and I do it again and again, I accumulate this wealth. And that's what I said. I, I do it in terms of, for instance, something I, I really sell, the money of my deceased uh, parents or relatives who, who, who don't really exist. But as well, I accumulate the addresses. I have more and more addresses, and I sell them. So I enter a, a, another business. And what it is about, it is now we come to this, it is about capital. It is not, not simply about what we are doing. This is important as well in terms of social reputation. As more friends I have, contacts I have, as better my reputation is. But we are not talking about this. We will be talking about, and, and this is the, the core of, of um, economics, we are talking about the accumulation uh, of capital and the concentration and centralization of capital. It is concentration of capitals already formed, meaning there is something in existence. The primitive accumulation, the original accumulation, I get some capital. It's not money. I, I get some capital, meaning I invest something. I have means, control over means of production. 
capitals already formed, destruction of their individual in independence, meaning I link it into this complete social process of production of the market. And then the important point is what I gain in addition is the loss of somebody else. The expropriation of capitalist by capitalist. So competition, what I gain, leaves you without it. In this way, it is somewhat a zero-sum game, meaning, let's go a little bit larger, we have 1,000. Initially, it's 500 to 500, equal property. Now, I take 100 of this by competition, means I have 600 as capital, which I can invest, from which I can make additional money, if you want, make additional profit. Now I have 100 more against 100 less here, which means at the same time, I have this benefit of getting profit out of an additional 100. In the next round, it means I will take another 100 of you and I have 700 because I have the stronger position. I'm in the stronger position. I can, for instance, this is just one example, buy better machines be more productive with the new machines. I can, for instance, lower the price that everybody will, be, will, will buy my product instead of yours. I have this reserve because I know, and this is why I can lower the price, I know in the next round you are out of competition and I can increase the price again. So at the end of the day, and there is some strategic thinking, some thinking in terms of time, I'm better off in the long run or medium. So we're, then we go on until ideally in terms of capitalist economy, I have this which is the monopoly. I own it all. I own the thousand, I have control over the thousand. Now, this ideal is barely reached, so at least you end up with something like 900 against 100. There are so, some small competitors. Competitors. This does not mean that in this situation there are no other companies anymore. Now we are talking about concentration, meaning in this one sector I'm dominant. The next step is centralization. Where I have different sectors, different uh, brands, or not, not brands, different sectors. So let's say this is information technology, hardware. Computers, processes, and I don't know what you need. This is software. And this is transport. Completely disjoint, completely in terms of, of course I can transport with my truck, with my railway or whatever, I can transport uh, computers. But this is not the point, I'm not linked to the, the transport of computers, of hardware. This is linked. There's a strong link. You need a computer for the software. You need a software for the computer. But you have the different sectors. 
you have the computer hardware producers and you have the software producers and then here are people who transport it. The first thing strategically is most likely I take over this. You have here the same situation of let's assume 500 to 500. You have concentration here. At the end you may have here as well 900 to 100. And then of course I am in a strong position and I link here. This can take different forms including illegal forms, cartels, trusts, things that are not really allowed by law in most of the countries. Or I am in such a strong position, this is most likely happening here, that I can actually buy the monopoly or the, the large enterprises there. Because the overall profit you make here is, is much smaller than you make it here. Information technology today means huge profit rates, huge amounts of profit. So if I am in this strong, economically strong sector, it's kind of easy to take over this sector. Because there is, if you want to have it simplified, there is not much money in it to buy a truck or to buy a fleet of trucks. It's peanuts, as they say. You don't need much money if you consider what you make here. Because here we are talking about real money. Look at uh, Forbes, for instance, Forbes website, they have these rankings, the richest people and all this rubbish. Um, but there you can see, actually, be careful, they, they are not correct. Um, at least not, not what uh, concerns the recent figures. But in general, it gives you the, an impression in which sectors of the economy do you find the richest people. You won't find them in, most likely, in transport, at least in general transport. You may find them actually in airline business. Capital grows in one place to a huge mass in a single hand because it has, in another place, been lost by many. The battle of competition is fought by cheaping of commodities. This is what's happening here, what's happening here. And this is what I said before. I lower the price, at least for some time. You buy it. It's my advantage, comparative advantage as well. And in the long run, I gain, I take over your capital to make more out of it. This is the simple version of it. We'll come back to it at a later stage. The cheapness of commodities demands citrus paribus, on the productiveness of labor. This is another point. As higher as your productivity is as worker, as cheap, as, as easier it is for me to produce cheap. How I do it is another question. I can simply lower the conditions, lower your income, lower your, your working conditions in terms of work longer, work harder, and now I'm talking about really work harder. Or I can do it by employing higher productive machinery. And this again on the scale of production. This is a, a further point. As more, in many cases, as more as I produce, as cheaper things are. If you ask me, one of you ask me for the production of a very specific software that you want to use in your very specific business, I will charge you quite a lot. 
because it's only one person who can, who will buy it. If you ask me to produce a chair, a very specific model, a very specific design, I have to charge you, I have to get the money from you. Because there are these different aspects involved, I have to design it, I have to calculate it, and then I have to produce it. The production is always the same. The immediate production in the strictest sense. But the design, it doesn't matter if I do it for one share or for 1,000. That remains the same. This is why it's so expensive, one of the reasons why it's so expensive, to buy something that is very individual. There is only one model, one item that you can buy. You can buy similars, you can buy other chairs, but only this one particular that you like or that fits your purpose. So, in this way, first and foremost, fundamentally, they are, it's, it's getting difficult, but the first instance is as more as we produce, as cheaper it is. In capitalism. Meaning, under the condition that I pay for the output in terms of what I can sell. I'm not interested in your working conditions. I mentioned in the one lectures, yes, lectures yesterday uh, the example of the Indian, of, of Henry Ford, car manufacturer, last century, <laughs> early, who was exactly arguing on this basis as more as I produce, and this was mass production, was introduced to a large extent by Henry Ford, working in this rational way along the belt. So he said, okay, if it works for me, I go to the Indian and I want to buy actually a chair. I didn't check this story, perhaps somebody can check it and, and get a reference for it. But so he went to the Indian and says, listen, what, what do you charge me if I buy this, this chair? It looks like this, and I have this idea. What do you charge me? And the Indian says, ah, give me $12, $12 that's fine. Then Henry Ford says, but mass production will make it cheaper. And he said, listen, I buy 20 of them. What's the price then? Per chair. And the Indian says, $15. And he looks, 15 why? Well, you have to pay me for the boredom of producing them. If I produce one, it's fun for me. It's interesting work, I feel challenged. If I do 20 times the same, it's pretty boring. Just pay me for my boredom. Pay me for the boredom of standing like Charlie Chaplin, we have had this uh, film there, Modern Times, standing there and doing day, day long the same thing for months, for years. It will further be remembered that with the development of the capitalist mode of production, there is an increase in the minimum amount of individual capital necessary to carry on a business under its normal conditions. Again, one aspect of this entire process, this little app somebody produces in a coffee shop, does, it, it just needs a mobile phone probably, I don't know, uh, at most a laptop where you can work and develop an app. And you sell it. But if you want to go really into business, your small laptop will not do the job anymore. You will not be able to do it on your own. You need supply stuff. You need other uh, software developers working with you. Which means as well you need an office space. 
there it shows you already what it is about. If you transport it just to your neighbor, you don't need anything. As soon as you go on with the transport, you have to invest in transport. As soon as you go on the larger scale, it affords more money, which means as well, for me as competitor, it is more difficult to get into it. Because I have my little laptop, I cannot afford to buy the computer I need or the entire IT uh, technology I need, uh, information technology I need, to compete with you. For this, I need a huge amount of capital again. The smaller capitals therefore crowd into spheres of production which modern industry has only sporadically or incompletely got hold of. This is what we talked about yesterday as well, small and large industry. You can still do your small business in your workshop as craftsperson. But large industry is left to, this, to these capitals that are at the center, large industries. Large industries, large businesses, large technologies, large investments. Here competition rages, because everybody, there are many people outcrowded, they cannot join the main business, so you go for the small business, and this means there are many competitors. You can go through Shangsha, through China, through wherever you want. I don't know how many search engines you find. There's a huge number of search engines. I don't know if there is a term like by doing, because Baidu is the main search engine, if I get it right, in China. At least in other countries, you have the term Googling. It's not searching, it's Googling. You can use other search engines to, to Google something. Probably you can use other search engines to buy do something. You have it in many other areas as well. You go to the supermarket and buy something. And if you look at the amount of supermarkets in terms of ownership, there are not so many, at least if you compare it with the small corner shops around the corner. The small shops, convenience shops. This is a matter of competition then, and one tries to get against the other. You have the huge brands. It's not only the high-end products, but as well the... We, we talked yesterday in one seminar about food. It's not just the high-end products, but it's as well the cheap stuff junk food. You have the mass products and then you have m many small service providers, many small restaurants who, who do the same, but they are competing with each other. They are not competing with the chain of restaurants. Not really. Or they do it in, a, in another way. It always ends in the ruin of many small capitalists who, whose capital partly pass into the hands of their conquerors, partly vanish. So going into the hands is here of their con conquerors. This is concentration. This may be uh, centralization. Or it is simply vanishing and not existing anymore. This is a very important part of the overall process. In general, there are exceptions to it, and there are very highly competitive, highly profitable small enterprises that actually don't need much capital for the time being. And you find this in many cases in the software industry, that what actually happens is 
If you are successful with your small application, with your small software package, it is relatively likely that the large enterprise will take over and say, I make you a profitable offer. You can join me, in which, legally, in which way ever, but then I actually secure your position. Your software, your apps, your whatsoever you are doing is fine now. You make a huge money out of it now. But nobody guarantees you what is going on tomorrow. I will guarantee you not this huge profit, but I will guarantee you a stable income for the next 40 years. What do you do? Take the risk or not? That's, of course, your decision. But at least there is some advantage in having a secure, stable position. You know this little car and this little caravan? Coming back to the common law of business balance, you get what you pay for means as well that production, of course, is linked to the quality of what we produce, whatever the quality is. But to some extent, basically, it depends on what I invest. In terms of work, labor, highly qualified work is in a better position to produce something that is valuable. Good raw material will lead, not automatically, but most likely to a good quality product. If you change this, you may be able to lower the price but the quality of the product is diminishing as well. So in this sense, this common law of business balance is relevant as well in terms of competition. Of course, I can compete with somebody who is established by offering a lower price product. But I have to think as well about the question, is the quality of this product suitable that maintain me in business, that keeps me in business? If I sell something for a very low price, which is rubbish, which is not really useful for a long term, I go for the better product, I pay a little bit more, but I get something more. So this is always something we have to consider as being in the background of these calculations. Of course, it is difficult to calculate in real terms because I don't know what really happens, what is the decision of the buyer, but at least I can know it. I can know it in abstract terms, in general terms. I know if I produce something that is not worth the money I pay for it, then I will, or this will influence my, uh, my decision. Which, of course, is as well something depending on needs, on wants. If I want to have something that I can use long term, I will invest more. If I just need something because it's raining now, and I just have to go across the street, but it's, it's really heavy rain, I will buy just a cheap umbrella, um, knowing that it will be broken at the other end of the, the, the campus. So this is my consideration as well. What do I need? Do I need something, when it comes to, to cars, that is really lasting with its high performance for a long time? I have to buy I have to invest more than if I need something that is just bringing me from one place to another. If I want to have comfort, 
I have to pay for the profit. If I, have to, if I want to invest in something that lasts, a lasting product, I have to pay for this as well. So all this goes into the consideration of um, the calculation, basically, uh, when it comes to the production. And all this is as well part of the competition. Meaning, whichever business I have, I don't compete in general terms with everybody who is in this business, but I invest or I consider as well who is the customer of this business, who buys these products. Is it highly specialized software? Or is it something everybody can use and uses? These are considerations. Is it high-end, coming back to the seminar, high-end restaurant products, high, good food, really excellent food? I don't compete with a restaurant that offers something that fills the stomach. And then I have to to look at the balance, how do I balance the two different interests, getting something into the stomach and enjoying it.